Leith Van Anselen, thank you so much for joining me for this special edition of Land Cycle Investor. Um, how are you? Good, good. Yeah, been pretty busy lately. Been doing a lot of uh, media appearances. Uh, I did three Sky News interviews in three nights in a row, so I'm a little bit tired, but, you know, pretty good. I'm in the swing of it, so I might as well keep it going. Yeah, and you send me those interviews and they're always really interesting because, of course, we cover things here that just aren't really covered in the mainstream. And I've done a few interviews myself over the last few days with the ABC, particularly about the uh, tax changes that have been suggested. They've not been legislated yet, but they are on the table for uh, Victorians. And that is to extend the current vacancy tax from the inner and middle ring suburbs where it now applies into the regions. So that means that anybody that's holding their property vacant for six months or more um, would be subject to a higher tax. And there's also a suggestion there about increasing land tax for sites that um, for land banking, basically. What's your take on it? Have you are you across the news? Yeah, I was actually asked about this uh, on Andrew Bolt's show uh, a couple of days ago, and uh, I think he was expecting me to come down and say, no, no, I think it's terrible, blah, 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 blah. Look, I'm not a fan of the Victorian government. I'm not a fan of them at all. But on this particular uh, issue, I don't really have an issue, especially um, on the vacant land side. So obviously, you know, if we're in the middle of a housing crisis, right? So the last thing you want is for vacant blocks to be staying vacant. And you want, um, you know landowners to build on them or if they're not going to build them sell them to someone else that will build build on them uh so i think it's you know it's good at the margin but look th this is really tokenistic stuff though Let, let's be honest the uh treasurer uh tim pallas as the victorian treasurer said that the changes will raise i think alongside the um land taxes they already have on the inner and middle suburbs um about 22 million or something he said some tiny little figure like that um, and that's probably over the forward estimate, so you know maybe over four years. So he said it's not about really raising revenue; it's about just changing behaviour. But um, you know, another problem I think um, you talked about the other day is it's actually going to be self-reported as well. So which means that you know um, it's sort of almost like an honesty system. Uh, that, that's my understanding of it anyway. And uh, yeah, look, ultimately the, the the problem we got is, and we'll probably get on this a bit later, but is that. You know, this this might bring you know a few dozen homes to market across the entire state, maybe uh, a few extra you know dozen extra houses. Um, but the problem we've got is really we need you know literally hundreds of thousands because we've got record immigration at the moment, and Victoria's population alone grew by about one hundred sixty thousand in the year to March, uh, which is unprecedented, and that's going to continue as long as they keep keep running this massive immigration program. So it's really not going to touch the sides, and the solutions really, I think to actually moderate immigration back to, you know, Howard government levels, uh, not the, you know, ridiculous stuff we saw in the last 20 years or uh, let alone the absolutely ballistic numbers we're seeing now under the Albanese government, which is just, you know, creating a rental crisis right across the nation. It's bananas. It's um, interesting you talk about, you know, Victoria getting the most of the immigration because, I went out, we had a long weekend recently, not the one that's just gone. I think, I think the, was it? No, actually, it wasn't a long weekend. It was just the first nice weekend that we'd had where it was like yeah, nice. Beautiful. And it was packed. It was like a Sunday. I could not park anywhere. I drove to about three or four parks, um, you know, in the in the um, metropolitan area. And it was just packed with cars. And I thought it's so different, like even from like two or three years ago, like prior to COVID, where we were as to where we are now with the traffic on the road. So we've definitely got more people coming into the state. But just to give um, people that are listening to this an idea in regard to vacancies and what we're talking about, because um, anyone that follows me will know that I'm also president of Prosper Australia. It's Australia's oldest economics organization and we do a lot of work in regard to tax taxation reform so we're very across these changes and and to some extent these changes have come in based on recommendations that we've put in our reports um, we have two reports out that that look at this specifically one is the speculative vacancies report um, it's been going for around 10 years um, we're about to re about to uh, release our latest speculative vacancies report and because it looks at long-term water usage data for in the greater metropolitan area. So we collect it via suburb. We look at how many properties per 
first suburb are using no liters of water a day and how many are just using a very minimal amount per day over a calendar year to try and get an assessment of, of properties that may be sitting empty for that period of time. It's not a perfect measure, but it's certainly a better measure than short-term rental statistics, which obviously only look at properties that are available for rent. We don't really see the hidden numbers of properties that are just sitting there vacant. And in the report that we did, um, you know, the last report that we did, there was over 69,000 properties that we identified as possibly vacant. So it's a lot more than, than people would perhaps realize. And I think that the amount of people that are currently paying the vacancy tax, tax in the inner and middle ring suburbs, it's about 700 or something i might be wrong in that but i do know from our talks to uh treasury that that um you know when we last inquired there's not one fine has been issued for anybody that is not uh paying the tax so it's not being audited um and uh this i think uh when i did an interview with raf epstein the other day on the abc he said to me that um he had heard that some owners were getting a letter saying asking them if they would consider paying the tax so they might be looking at properties that are potentially vacant and then I, would, I wish somebody would ask me if I would consider whether I want to pay my income tax. But the other report that we do is obviously the stage releases report, which is um, looking at uh, greenfield sites that are just being held empty and in the big master planned communities, basically. And, and in that report, we found that, you know, these big developers that kind of buy swathes of land in advance and then they drip feed it onto the market in staged releases in order to keep, you know, property prices high. We found, you know, in some of those situations, you know, developers had had land for you know 10 10 years and yet still 76 percent of it had not been built on and even though it was permitted for housing so we're looking at a real situation here where the government again is doing the right thing by saying okay we want to stimulate supply but they're coming out with a tax that is self-reported they're not really auditing it properly it's not really it's significant enough the penalties aren't significant enough to get that supply onto the market and therefore is it actually going to do anything to uh, property prices, because that's what people, you know, land cycle investor, people want to know, do we stay in Victoria or do we flee the state? You know, is it actually going to do anything, you know, in, in regard to affecting property prices or affecting, you know, flooding the market with a sudden influx of, of supply? And and you would say no, right? Absolutely. Look, look uh, pretty much, you know, this is symbolic of everything across the whole housing system. It's, you know, uh, symbolism over, over substance. And, a classic example, you know, you can see the national the national cabinet's 1.2 million homes proposal. It, has, it doesn't have a snowflakes chance in hell of actually happening and and actually working. Um, you know, so basically, I think it was about six weeks ago the national cabinet got together and they said, "Oh, we're going to build 1.2 million homes in five years to solve the housing crisis, and they're going to do it just by so by you know magically, um, you know, loosening planning." Now. It's never going to happen because we've got obviously higher interest rates than we've had. Uh, like for starters, we've, we've only ever built over 220,000 homes in a year once. And that was in, I think, uh, 2016 or 2017. And we built 223,000 that year. So they want to magically build 240,000 for five consecutive years, which has never been done before. In the time we've got high interest rates, we've got obviously materials prices have risen by about 40% over the pandemic. We've got labor shortages problems of land and also it's not in developers interest to flood the market with supply because that's working against their interests because that'll push down prices so developers won't do it and it also ignores the fact that um that there are actually hundreds of thousands of homes that have been approved for construction but construction is not going ahead because of those factors i just mentioned uh, it's not profitable for the developers um you know they can't get labor you know, the materials costs are too high, interest rates are too high, can't get financing, all that sort of stuff. So th th this whole notion that you can magically, you know, um, relax planning and, you know, allow, allow developers to basically build high-rise everywhere, then you're going to magically get this supply, this ginormous supply response when you've got these conditions is just laughable. And that's kind of another one of these symptoms of saying, oh, we're going to fix it through tokenism, um, you know, on the supply side when really the answer is on the demand side. And, you know, in terms of don't run the biggest, like you don't fix the supply problem by running the biggest and most extreme population growth in the nation's history uh, and ramping demand. Well, that's just bonkers, stupid. Uh, but that's basically what they're doing. So it's all, you know, forget the, the main issue over here and let's just focus on these little tokenistic things, which sound good, the nice little media bites, um, that sort of thing. But every day that, you know, meanwhile, every day the housing crisis actually gets worse. 
And you know, obviously, if you're a if you're an investor, well, that's good news because we're seeing property prices rebound despite the fact that we've had mortgage uh, we've had interest rates go up by four percent since you know May last year. Um, and even though the RBA has been on hold since June, average mortgage rates continue to rise because we've got this fixed rate mortgage reset that's going to you know run on for uh, you know probably about another six months. And what that means is people are resetting from these two percent mortgages to six percent plus, and that's increasing the average mortgage rate. And despite that. Prices are still rising, um, and obviously rents are going through ballistic as well. We've got a record tight rental market, and that's primarily because we're basically we've flooded the place with extra bodies who need housing. And um, you know, it's it's kind of uh, yeah, it wasn't expected by most economists except for Stephen Kukulis that you basically get rising property prices in the face of um, high interest rates and lower uh, borrowing capacity. But yet here we are. And the federal government's really to blame for it. So, um, you know, th th this this Victorian government uh, tax, you know, land tax hike, yeah, okay, it's good at the margin. I support it, but it's not really solving the problem. And um, it's just another, you know, it, it's another, it's a bit of a distraction really to say, look, 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 we're doing something about it when they're not really doing something about it. And really, if, if, um, if the new new Premier Jacinta Allen was serious, you'd get on the phone to uh, Anthony Albanese and saying, look, you've got to slow the migration down because we can't take this many people in the state. Uh, and and so would uh, Chris Minns in New South Wales because those two states are taking the lion's share of the migrants and that's what's causing the problem. And at the same time, they'd also say um, to Albanese that, look, for every migrant that lands in our state, you must give us $100,000 to help pay for the infrastructure because the whole problem, I think I said this last time, I was on or one of the other times, the reason why I've got these weird settings whereby the federal government keeps pumping in all these migrants is because they get most of the gains from immigration because the feds collect 80% of the tax revenue and the states and local governments only collect 20%. So you've got this kind of misalignment of incentives where the federal government gets all the gains from immigration through personal income taxes and company taxes. So they want to keep running it really hard, whereas all the costs fall on the states and then they end up falling on us because the states can't afford it. So what they end up doing is end up send, uh, selling off all the assets and then you end up paying private taxes, is what I call them, like toll roads, fees and all this other stuff to privatise entities. And it's all basically been done to try and keep up with this mass population growth. So um, you know, every time you bring in a million extra people, you've got to build all these hospitals, schools, public transport, um, you know, uh, roads, et cetera. And they've ended up, so they end up selling off all this stuff to try and get some money, quick money in the door and then you end up just paying user fees, which are way higher than what you would have paid otherwise. Um, and the classic example, I always use Sydney as an example. In 2000, when, around about time of the Olympics, when Sydney had about 3.8 million people, um, they had about two toll roads. So they had the the Sydney Harbour Bridge, and I think the tunnel might have been built then, but the, basically if you crossed the bridge, you paid a toll, and then there was one near the airport. Now they've got about 20. And that's because they've just basically had to build all these toll roads everywhere. Uh, to try and keep pace with this in, this uh, mass population growth they've had. Um, toll roads are incredibly expensive. You've got to build tunnels and all that sort of stuff. So it costs a whole lot of money. You've got to reclaim land because it's already built out. So now if you want to drive around Sydney, you've got more congestion than you had 20 years ago, despite the fact to build all this stuff. And you get basically transurban reaching into your pocket, pulling out a $20 note anytime you try and drive anywhere because you've got to pay tolls, whereas 20 years ago you didn't. And this is all because we've been running this ridiculous immigration program which we didn't need to run and it's basically made everyone's life worse um you know like some immigration it's a bit like salt some immigration is good and, and it makes the dish taste better but if you have too much it tastes bad and if you have way too much like we do at the moment it becomes toxic it can actually kill you and that's sort of where we're at now and i guarantee you the next the next stage we're going to have is we're going to have a water crisis because four years ago the nation obviously had a, had a long drought and Sydney's water supply was down to 20%. What's going to happen next time we have a drought, and uh, which is supposedly coming, and we've got, literally, you know, we've got literally millions more people in the country to provide water to, the solution then will be to build more desalination plants over here to push up everyone's average water cost. And then you've got the problem of all, how do you get the water from, say, the coast in Sydney to western Sydney, where a lot of the migrants are going, which is 30 to 50 kilometres away. You've got to somehow pipe it uphill. 30, you've got to build the pipelines. You've got to then pipe it against gravity, which takes a lot of power um, to pump it to these western suburbs areas. And I think water is going to be the next 
sort of crisis for this country because we just don't have the natural water supply to support all these people. And then, um, yeah, but that's the that's the path that's laid us on. You know, housing crisis, water crisis, lack of hospitals, schools, infrastructure, everything, and it's all in an all can be unavoid. You know, you know it, it could all be avoided by the, um, you know, by good policy in the federal government not running the most extreme immigration policy in the nation's history. I think we said before when we did um, a, a video not so long ago um, with Cameron, Dr. Cameron Murray, um, we were discussing that the government really has no interest in creating an affordable housing market because it would not be politically popular for them to do so. And I've said numerous times as my work in the real estate industry, buyers really don't want an affordable housing market either because nobody wants to buy into a housing market where the prices may go backwards from where they are now. And reasonably speaking, in order to get affordable housing, we would need to put policies in place to take speculation out of the property market, which in turn would reduce land prices. And there's just not the energy in government to do that. So when you see things come in the news about, you know, vacancy taxes, which are low hanging fruit because Nobody likes the guy that keeps the property vacant and doesn't have anybody living there whilst their kids can't afford to get in the housing market or whilst people are struggling with rent. So it's very easy to target that that you know demographic as, as it is to target you know foreign investors. You know, we don't want foreigners buying up our land. Um, and essentially what we've got out of that is a toll booth economy, which is what you're talking about, which is <laughs> we're I'm gonna steal that. Yeah, yeah still what well, you can for your next headline. Yeah. I feel enough of your headlines, so you are you are committed to. But um, yeah, I mean that the that we we're, we're now paying for everything, and and we've had the discussion before about gas prices that we're paying for something that should be dirt cheap in this country, and yet we're paying you know international uh, prices. Well, at least we are we're not not so much in WA, but certainly no, in the East Coast. Yeah, in the East Coast. And and that means that, you know, when, when it comes to problems of inflation and the RBA say, OK, we're going to put up rates, it's cr basically crippling the economy rather than doing anything to assist people because, you know, OK, there may be prices that have lowered, but, you know, we're, we're certainly seeing, you know, petrol prices at the pump go up again. And, um, you know, that these types of things, they're just not beneficial to a thriving economy, which is essentially why we have a cycle, because then the, the psychology of anybody watching this would be that, you know, they need to to go into some form of investment. And it's quite interesting, the trends that I've been seeing in the property market, because people are pretty concerned about yield now, far more so than they were, were you know, in the beginning of this cycle, which I would say was kind of between 2012 and 2017, where rates were very low, yields were low, but you were getting a lot of capital growth. And of course, it was cheap to, to borrow money. Um, now people are very concerned about having a good yield for their property. And the properties that I am seeing really kind of uh, this kind of property business that is taking off. And and I think a real estate agent said, I was trying to think how he termed it to me. He said um, something about that. This is the new form of investment or is this, this is the new way to go. And that is the number of rooming houses that are popping up mm. now. Because there's demand for rentals. And so I'm going through properties. Now, these are just suburban homes. Um, I went through one recently in a, in a suburb in, you know, north of um, Melbourne. Um, surrounded by you know normal home buyers but the home's been uh it's permitted it's been renovated into a nine bedroom two bathroom property it's uh collecting over two hundred dollars a week for each bedroom and uh yeah the yield is like i think the the gross yield is close to like nine percent on this property now the the owner whoever it does they, they have to um, subsidize electricity and gas prices but because there's ways to bring those costs down with solar power and you know um a little bit of restriction about you know making sure that lights are turned off you know having like door locks that make sure that when you lock your door all the lights in the room go off so there's things like that that they can do to reduce prices but that's a better yield than you would get like on a commercial investment but this is like the new energy now is because people are saying there's a rental crisis we'll buy a property and we'll just rent room by room and yeah it brings it brings it can bring problems but it's uh it's um a trend that is is taking off have you noticed anything have you had your yeah ears C certainly well i mean so we've got a toll booth economy and a slumlord economy so it sounds a bit but yeah. um yeah look certainly flatmates.com.au that's like a sort of share listing um share housing portal i think it's run by uh the rea group um 
so they so they they've actually noticed that they, they, they they've commented that their their number of people applying to that looking for group housing sort of gone up it basically doubled in the last year so that's some hard data but also um uh one of the i think shelter.org or something uh, one of those um uh, organizations did a report about a month or so ago which said that basically the homelessness rates are rocketing as well so and then uh the the abc today so we're recording this on a thursday um did a whole report about how you know people in the sort of 30s and 40s now are being forced to move back home into the parents house into granny flats so the the parents are now building these granny flats in their backyards to for their adult children to live in and not just adults like sort of almost middle-aged adults because they can't find rentals anywhere so so they're moving back in and building these sort of you know cheap pre prefab granny flats in the backyard of their parents house so this is the kind of um you know society we're creating for ourselves which to me, I don't know about you, Catherine, but I think that's actually a pretty big step back in your quality of life. If you've gone from, you know, people being able to live in their own housing to suddenly being forced to live in share housing um, in these granny flats, tiny homes, all becoming homeless. I don't think that's a real, you know, advancement in society, but that's kind of what we're doing. And, um, you know, I'm 45 and I remember growing up when I was a kid at sort of primary school. Pretty much no one I knew, this was a state school, like just a, you know, state school. It was like, I think one family lived in an apartment back then. And it was like pretty, pretty odd. And they were actually, you know, uh, fairly poor. Um, but everyone else lived in houses. We had backyards, all that sort of stuff. And um, that nowadays, you know, if you, if you're a kid now at primary school, you know, the same school, there'd probably be, I don't know, 30, 40% of the households you live in apartments now. And, um, you know, that, that, that's I'm talking about households with kids. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with apartment living, but that's a pretty big change in quality of life that's happened in, you know, just sort of 40 years. And, um, you know, it's just going to continue happening like that. And in fact, the Urban Task Force, they, they released um, projections for Sydney in 2016. So they're based on 2016 census data. And they said that Sydney, according to their projections, and this is before this, you know, elbows ramped up immigration even more. Um, they said that Sydney is going to go from basically in 2016, it had 56% of its dwellings were detached houses. And by 2056, which is what it forecast, it said that only 25% of dwellings in Sydney would be detached houses. So you'd have 25% detached, um, 50% apartments and 25% townhouses. Mm. So it's gone from 56% detached houses down to 25%. And all, all that tells you is that pretty much ha- uh, detached houses is going to be very exclusive and are going to be for the richest or those who got in, you know, decades before. And the overwhelming majority of people are going to be, you know, well, well half, the, half the people are going to be forced to live in apartments and the other other quarter in townhouses. And that's a pretty, and, and- that's a pretty big uh, loss in quality of life in my view. Um, you know, and it's all, it's pretty much driven by this mass population growth that we're having. I mean, there's no other explanation for it. If you keep growing the population into a sort of urban footprint that's constrained, well, you're going to have to house them somehow. You're going to house them in apartments because it's the, it's the path of least resistance. And that's okay. basically the change in the quality of life we're having. Everything that you've said there is is kind of why I've always said to my clients that have come to me that if you're looking for growth, you know. Buy land. Like, buy land, yeah. Buy, yeah. buy the old suburban house and a block of land that you can. They're not making any more of it. You can put so and and actually just talking on that um Victoria's legislation uh, has changed to allow we it used to be in Victoria that you had to have a genuine granny to have a granny flat you know you, you couldn't just build a granny flat in the backyard like you can in, in Queensland but of course that legislation is changing and and I'm not against that legislation changing you know we want land to be utilised to its best and highest use and if you can put a second dwelling on it then then that's all good for supply but you're right our standard of life is not going up uh, certainly immigration I think this was something that came through to me when I put out I think oh it's when I tweeted your um interview one of the interviews that you'd done and where you were talking about immigration and somebody said well you know how is that a bad thing this is just rubbish how can you say that it's it's not improving our quality of life and it's actually making the country uh wealthier you know because our GDP is uh going up or something along those lines which I know you, you're responsible well, well, well actually GDP <laughs> per capita is not going up so yeah. um which is you know so yeah sure you can grow the pie you can just we, we could bring in a million people tomorrow like just bring in you know well you know a million people in the next year just bring in just jumbo jets versus jumbo jets every single day just flood them in here and guess what a gdp will go up no doubt you got more more people more people coming in more demand more spending etc but we'll everyone slice of the pie improve and 
And the whole GDP thing is a pretty crappy measure, to be quite frank. It's just all it, all it measures is economic activity. Right? It doesn't tell you about your quality of life. It doesn't tell you about distribution of wealth, distribution of income, um, you know, quality of the environment, quality of your air supply, whether you can get a you know seat on a train where, or having to stand like squashed against a window like this. Um, you know, how long it takes you to drive from A to B. Um, like you said, whether you can get a park to go, like a car park to get to the uh, local park to then sit on an oval, all these sorts of things, you know, spot at the beach, all this kind of stuff. Um, all that stuff is degraded. Now, you know, it, it's not about having zero immigration or having what we've got now. Like it's not a binary choice between zero and, and, I, and I don't support zero immigration. But what I support is kind of the levels we had until it went bananas from about 2005. And that was basically, you know, six years post-World War II, we averaged 80,000 a year. I'd even be happy with 100. But that's sort of the levels we should be going for, not like we had last year, which is 454,000 in the year to March. And in fact, if you look at the year to June using the national accounts population data, it's probably closer to half a million in one year. That's just bonkers. We can't, we can't do that. And, um, you know, unfortunately, the intergeneration report said that we're going to grow by 14 million people in 40, 40 years. That's a Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, and Adelaide in just 40 years. How's that going to work? Um, where, where's all the, where's the housing going to come? It's going to, all going to be high-rise for starters. We all know that. Um, overall majority of it's going to be high-rise apartments because that's going to be the future. Where's the infrastructure going, going to come from? How are we going to safeguard the environment? How are we going to reach this mythical net zero thing, which is the biggest load of hogwash I've ever heard in terms of, you know, actually reality? How are we going to get Australia's em um, emissions magically down to zero when we've got 50, over 50% 50 more people? Just doesn't, none of the maths works. Um, how are we going to supply enough water, which uses a lot of energy, which will then destroy net zero? You know, we're already got, we're already, uh, you know, Perth is literally running off desalinated water. Sydney and Melbourne will be start to run from desalinated water, um, you know, as soon as we go back to, you know, drought-like conditions or even more normal conditions. The last three years have been bailed out by record rainfall because of this little Nino, which has filled up all the dams. But, you know, once we add more and more people and the rainfall goes back to normal or we have drought conditions, we're going to be living on desalinated water, which costs a lot of money and is expensive and uh, uses heaps of energy. Um, so, you know, all this sort of stuff, it just doesn't work when you live in the driest continent of earth. And and also um, the other thing is Australia is wealthy because we've got a lot of natural resources. That's primarily why we're wealthy. We're not wealthy for any other reason. Yeah. And uh, what's is it really sensible to dilute your, your natural wealth by 50% more people in 40 years? So, you know, it's kind of like you're rocking up to get, you know, say, say, say your parents die, right? You go, you go to your, you meet the lawyer for your inheritance and you got, you know, you and someone else. And then suddenly a long lost brother comes out of nowhere you never knew about, you know, like an illegitimate uh, John Snow uh, brother <laughs> or something comes along and goes, oh, I'll take a third. So like, what? So your wealth has suddenly been cut. Well, that's kind of what we're doing by running this huge population growth. Um, we're growing it so quickly. And under the intergeneration report, it says we're going to literally grow by just over 50% in 40 years. Well, guess what? The mineral wealth's not getting any bigger. In fact, it's depleting every year. And you're going to be spreading that over more and more people. So in a country like Australia, that actually makes you poorer per head. Now, again, you know, obviously we need to have some population growth. We need to have some immigration. We should take some, uh, some, you know, uh, refugee intake and all that sort of stuff. But, but the refugee intake's tiny compared to the total. Um, overwhelming, you know, majorities, these economic migrants. And, you know, like we just need to cool it down and bring it back to historical levels, like we had 60 years post World War II before we just went bananas in the mid 2000s and even more bananas now. Just simple as that. Like, no one was having these arguments in two, around about the time of the 2000 Olympics when, uh, you know, I almost argue that was peak Australia. Like, you know, we had the two, uh, 2000 Olympics, um, Sydney and Melbourne were at sort of good sizes, they weren't too large yet. Um, you know, national pride was great. No one was sitting there going, Australia, you're not taking your fair share of migrants. You know, you're, you're, you know, you need to more than double it because you're not doing enough. Like, if we hadn't gone on this road, we wouldn't be having this conversation and no one would be thinking anything about it. But somehow the government has made us think it's normal to take, you know, what 
235,000 net overseas migration, which is a long-term average predicted by the intergeneration report. They've, they've, they've sort of gaslit us into thinking that that's the normal amount. It's not. It's a you know it's under 100,000. That's the normal amount if you look at the average since World War II. So um, you know, basically, the government is creating these problems for us: housing, infrastructure, everything else. And uh, I guess if you're a you know if you're looking to get in the property market, the good news is you're going to have this very strong tailwind from the federal government just fire hosing all these people into us. And and if you own land, well, that's a pretty strong you know tailwind for your um, for your land values going forward. Um, you know, it, it, you know, there's all these uh, interest rates and all that stuff. That's all they're, they're all cyclical forces which go up and down and whatever, and they and they can hurt you over the short to medium term. But over the long run, if you've got this massive population growth coming in, that's federal government policy, and they're going to keep running it for decades. That's a pretty strong buy signal, I think. Yeah, ab absolutely. It's interesting what you're talking about, about the number of apartments that are going to be built in order to ha house the incoming population and how, you know, we, we've got people moving back home. It kind of like rings to that same situation that, and this was uncovered really over that, that two year period of COVID. The insanity that happened over that time really cannot be shoved under the carpet as just, you know, we didn't know what was happening. I mean, the the um, you know, the lockdowns, the destroying of businesses which still haven't recovered, coming out of it, you know, into the situation that we've got now with with mass immigration being pushed into the country against, you know, there's there's just record low supply, the boom that happened in property prices, you know, the land boom. And, you know, over that period, I think people became a lot more suspicious about government. And again, we've discussed this before, that a lot of people that talk to me about property, they don't really want to be close to the cities so much anymore, particularly depending on what stage of life that they're at. But if they're in an older stage of life and they're in their 40s and their 50s, they're now thinking about moving to regional area where they can be more self-sustained, where they can get away from government. Nobody trusts in government. And at the same time, we had a lot of um, conspiracy theories that came out, which aren't really conspiracy theories because they are indeed happening and that is the influence from the world economic forum um the idea that you know the advert which was then scrapped and, and taken off that you know you shall own nothing can be happy yeah, and be happy sharing economy um which is you know that you, you basically borrow and share everything you don't need to own anything you just hire borrow share which is kind of the trend that we we've seen develop you know over the last few years with airbnb and uh renting out your parking space and borrowing a car rather than buying a car and you know we've seen this kind of infiltrate in but uh, you know alongside that you've got the build to rent model uh which is is now taking off because they have lower land tax rates you know they have a, a slash on land tax they're, they're building not for them to sell, but for investors to hold them and reap the the yields and also, you know, the gain that would come from the land value because they're built in premium sites. Um, and, you know, for renters basically to to rent for life in, in an apartment, but they're not necessarily cheap rentals. You know, they're rentals that are usually above market prices because they come with facilities and they they want to attract quality tenants. So, again, it's there's there's very much a. Um, fragment of Australia that is going to constantly be forgotten and if anyone's ever traveled I mean I've traveled to um, places like Canada and obviously I'm from England so London where they really have a homeless we have a homeless crisis here but they have a homeless crisis where people are on the street you know in America the same you know in the bigger cities of America where you're stepping over people that are sleeping on the street and that's kind of where this economy is going that's why I say to people you know buy land and secure your housing now because it is something that you need for survival, as well as the fact that it's treated like an investment um, by our economy. But I think that trend is, is a bit worrying. It, it's alongside the idea, and we've been talking about this for years and years, because I know when I was um, writing articles um, that you were publishing, um, where we were talking about what is healthy housing, and the idea that actually healthy housing and housing that's good for the economy is, is your house with a garden around it where, you know, um, it, it's not an, a big apartment block, which is a real energy guzzler. And because on top of this, we've got this idea that they want to have these 15 minute cities of which Melbourne's, all, you know, kind of like a part of so that we we all live within a certain area and we don't necessarily need to travel far out of that area. And then I, I interviewed um, Pete Wargent uh, last week, you know, who was saying that now on his bank statements, he gets told what his carbon footprint is. Mm. Pete you know, I mean, it, it just becomes like almost the, the mo we, we're being sucked into this. We don't have any choice. It's happening around us. We're all being, you know, that those types of trends, 
they are really worrying. You've got children. I don't have children, but you you have children. You must wonder with your kids what kind of Australia they're coming. Well, world really, because it's not just Australia. But do you think about it? I mean, what's your advice? No. I I hundred percent I think about it all the time. Like I, you know, I've got look look I've got um I've got a fifteen year old son who's heavily autistic, so his life's gonna be hard anyway. And basically he's probably gonna be living with us forever, which kind of sucks, but that's the way it is. Um my daughter is thirteen and she's uh, and I look at her all the time and go, Man, she's gotta have it. Like she's got one thing going in a favor in that uh this might come across as bad, but she's female, right? So we we live in a situation where I'd hate to be a young man now. Because um, just the way everything's going, you're autom- especially a young white man. You're probably going to be, uh, um, you know, you're going to be looked over for a lot of things because, you know, you're a young white man, right? You know, so but so so she's a daughter. That that's good. Problem is, like like everything, um, she's going to struggle to buy a house, and I know, and I've already started saving up for it. And I haven't even paid off my own debt, my own mortgage and stuff. But I know that. Um, you know, we're going to have to basically, you know, give her hundreds of thousands of dollars through the bank of mum and dad to help her secure a house because it's going to be impossible otherwise. There's just no way you can do it. Like, I, I couldn't live in the house I'm in now, uh, except that I bought it in 2013, uh, January 2013. If I tried to buy this house now, there's no way I could afford it because the price has just gone up so much. And all that tells you is that because I'm 45, I'm better off than I would have been if I was 35. Mm-hmm. So it's sort of, you know, you're, you're, Success in life is determined to a large degree about when what's you know when you're born effectively. So my parents had a lot easier than I do because they you know they're baby boomers. I uh, got the house cheap, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and they live in a uh, well. My mum lives in a more expensive house than I live in uh, in a better area, and they got it dirt cheap because they got it in the, you know 1972. But there's no way someone who's 20 year old now could ever hope to live in the house I live in unless they're you know. They, like they're on the absolute upper end of the income threshold um, because they're just too young and the prices have gone up too high. So it's kind of, you know, this, and, and the fact I live in a detached house, like even that's a barrier now. So um, yeah, I think about it all the time. I think about, you know, what, what life's going to be for them. And also obviously jobs are less secure and um, you know, so it's kind of different and, 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 there aren't these, there aren't nearly as many graduate programs now available uh, for people. So even if you do go to university, so like when I went to uni, I did honours in economics at Melbourne Uni, uh, commerce, economics, and there was twenty people in my honours year, and you know I got I think a two A honours, which is like a I think seventy eight percent average or something, which is good, but not you know not the top of the class, but pretty good. Uh, really easy for me to get a job. There's only twenty of us, and then when I went in the workforce there was huge graduate programs. And this is back when the unemployment rate was about 9%. So this was sort of the uh, 1998 I was applying. Um, so the unemployment rate was high. But even so, it was really easy to get a job because there wasn't too many graduates and the graduate programs were huge. You know, the, oh, I had the pick of jobs. Now, there's way more people doing university. So my you, my uh, honours in economics cost me $12,000, right? If you want to do it now, it's probably 50, 60. For the same exactly the same course there's also um the number of people doing honors in economics isn't 20 i'm guessing it's more like 60 because i met a young guy who did the same course about uh six seven years ago at Melbourne, same university he uh, had coffee with him and he said there was like 45 in his class and i'm like well that's more that's more than double what i had and i'm assuming it's just the numbers have grown since then so you've got more people doing university they're paying more for it but yet the employers have all cut their graduate positions down. So it's just, it doesn't make sense. You've got this ginormous funnel of people doing uni and very little opportunities for them. So they're already at a disadvantage there. And then even if they can afford to get, you know, get one of these jobs that I got, they're paying a much higher hex debt. So they're already behind there. And then they've, they're facing a housing market that is orders of magnitude worse than what I faced. Um, you know, when I bought my first place in uh, 2006, which is only like 100 metres away from here. Um, so, you know, the, the cards are stacked against it. And I think about this stuff all the time because it's, you know, obviously it's my kids. And, uh, so I just know that, well, look, they're going to have it harder than me, but the one thing is I can probably equalize and I'll have to by basically giving them hundreds of thousands of dollars to help them buy a house. And that's just basically the bank of mum and dad. So 
you know, it's bad for society because I, I will hopefully be in a position to do that. But what if you're not? And all it means is that um, basically we're going to have this sort of generational wealth situation where it's going to be a class system where, you know, basically certain groups can end up, you know, like they can pass down wealth from generation to generation and to help their kids out. But the people who aren't, who, who don't have that, uh, who, who aren't in that position are going to struggle. So it's, um, yeah, it's an absolute inequality disaster in the making. And the other thing I didn't mention is obviously um, with, with the rents rising so so quickly, it's going to be harder to save a deposit for a house. So it's already, you have to save way more than what I did when I bought a house. But then while you're saving, you're going to struggle even more because you're paying higher rents than what I paid when I was renting. Mm-hmm. So it's just kind of, you know, the, the, the cards are stacked in all these different ways mm-hmm. against um, against my kids' generation. And um, yeah, it's, it's absolutely deplorable. It's depressing, but unfortunately, you know, I'd argue the government's making it worse uh, yeah. by by running these these stupid policies. So anyway, that's the that, that's the society we live in, unfortunately. Um, but you know, if you're a land cycle investor, buy land. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, yeah, as I said, I'm not, yeah, it, <laughs> yeah, no, it sounds pretty. <laughs> but but that, that, that's the reality of it. They're not making any more of it, right? So. Um, yeah. You know, oh, but, well, totally. I mean, every, every, all the time people say to me, you know, in every cycle, I remember reading about it, gosh, because I, I used to be such a bear when I first started off in, in writing about housing market, kind of before I got all my, you know, acquired my cyclical knowledge. But, um, you know, people would always say, how can the pro- prices go any higher? You know, how can it just get more unaffordable? And yet, of course, it does. You know, you, you can't imagine at this point how prices will continue to go up. But of course, you've just given one um reasoning there and that is that we have it's it's no different in essence from what the classical economists used to write about and of course what henry george wrote about when he wrote the book progress and poverty you know and basically said there will always be this divide between the ones that are reaping the rewards from progress and the poverty the growing size of the poverty bucket because you've got the people that do own and they can own the housing and that means that they're going to get into the best retirement homes as well when they die because they're going to sell their house and it's going to elevate them up and the people that don't own land and they they remain renters and then you've got people that can't even afford to rent so you've got this grown pool of homelessness as well at the bottom they just fall through the cracks all the time um and and it is the bank of mum and dad you know if you've got, if you've got a property then you've got equity you've got something that you can borrow against you've got something that you can develop you've got something that has has um because of all of these dynamics in the economy has created land price inflation and it means that you're going to pass that down either whilst you're alive or when you're not alive <laughs> one way or another it's going to your children the other because influence is is you know what we see in the monetary system we're going through this change in the monetary system which we probably haven't really spoken too much about but you know it's a change in digital currency it does mean that there's going to be a lot more control from government over um, what you can spend and and your monetary habits aren't going to be so easy to uh, hide anymore because it's going to be tracked um going to be sit on sit on a blockchain and therefore we've we've got situations now where you have these um you know it's going to be much it's going to cut out the middleman basically the blockchain so then you've got a uh, more of ease of transaction more ease of groups of people buying together which is already occurring but it's going to be on a much bigger scale you know um so i mean there's energy really there for prices to go higher but even if we're just talking about this cycle um you know we we had a real quick phone chat before we came um onto this call uh and that was um, about rates and what's going to happen because there's nervousness in the economy. Okay, we, we've anybody that's listened to this, anyone that follows my work, I'm really set on the cycle. To me, there is no reason why this cycle isn't going to play out. We're going to get to around twenty, a peak in around 2026, which might be when you start to see more supply come on the market. We're then going to have a downturn into 2028. That anybody that follows me will know all of my reasoning as to why I'm saying that. But there is this interim period that we've got now, which is, you know, what do I do? Um, if you're going to be buying now, you definitely want to be buying in a state w- which is going to reap the rewards in the first half of the next cycle. So that would be either Melbourne or Sydney. But uh, wh- what do you see happening to rates? You've got quite an interesting take on it. Yeah, look, I, I, I this is one of those things I'll say this now and then someone will probably watch this back in three months and go, hey, it was wrong because, <laughs> you know, that's the way it is. But, uh, but um, no, look, I, I, I think the RBA is probably uh, going to, I think we're at the peak, basically, of the interest rates. So, um, you know, there's a few forces going, uh, you know, back and forth. But um, my view is that, that we're at the peak, and the but the RBA will 
probably end up cutting sort of sometime mid next year. I originally was saying, I think a couple of months ago, I said early next year, but it just seems like we've got this kind of long tail inflation with this oil, oil with the uh, petrol prices and that's sort of keeping the inflation rate a bit higher. But, um, you know, the, the reason why I think they'll, they'll remain on hold is that, you know, we've got this inbuilt tightening with the fixed rate mortgage reset, number one. So, Basically, average mortgage rates are continuing to rise, and they'll, they'll they'll continue doing that, and sort of into mid next year, um, as more people reset from these two percent fixed rates up to six. So that means that the average mortgage rate paid across the whole economy is going to keep rising. So we're going to get this ongoing monetary tightening, even if the RBA does nothing. Um, but more importantly, we've got to get a really you know, significantly weakening economy. So we've basically got a per capita recession at the moment. So the economy is growing overall because it's got two and a half percent population growth through the immigration explosion but uh per head so everyone sliced the pie is falling and that and that slice is falling because we've actually got um, negative uh household consumption in real terms so once you adjust for inflation so basically households are cutting back they're spending less we've got falling retail sales once you adjust for inflation and actually worse if you adjust for population growth on both of them um and also uh the labor market's now starting to weaken uh, quite significantly so it hasn't quite been captured in the headline unemployment rate yet but basically the number of job ads is falling you know quite sharply more importantly the number of applications per job ad is now a fair way above what it was pre-pandemic so the reason for that is we've got obviously this weakening labor demand as the economy slows but we've got record labor supply growth because of this mass immigration so basically the labor supply is growing at double the rate it was pre-pandemic even when we had high immigration then it's never grown this fast and all it means is that basically more people are chasing fewer jobs uh, fewer job ads and that that's a real sign of uh, labor market slack also the um, the other main indicator of the, uh, the the other main the other alternative unemployment measure which is done by Roy Morgan and a lot of people actually think it's better um that's actually uh, Roy Morgan unemployment's grown uh, is actually shot up to March 2021 levels so it's actually shot up quite a lot and the reason for that, they cite, is that the, the economy is creating jobs, but it's not creating nearly enough jobs to soak, soak up all these extra workers that are coming in through migration. So all those sort of things tell you that we're going to have rising unemployment, rising underemployment, wage growth is going to get stifled because we're going to have that rising unemployment. And that's sort of a signal for the RBA not to raise rates, uh, all those things. So I think we'll probably end up um, you know, staying on hold. Um, the fact of working against that is... Obviously, we've got this petrol price uh, spike that's happened because OPEC's cut the oil supply. We've also got a you know slightly lower Australian dollar. Um, that could cause problems in that if uh, suppliers like businesses, et cetera, start passing on those extra costs to in their goods and services, that could lead to second round inflation. Uh, the other one is obviously caused by the immigration itself. So running this super high immigration is actually, uh, although it can dampen wage growth, which is bad for workers, and put up unemployment, it's actually, you know, leading to a huge spike in rents. So, um, you know, we've had, we've, we've, uh, the rents will probably peak as the CPI measures them as part of inflation will we'll, uh, probably lift to about 10% um, from about eight and a half percent currently. So um, that is going to create a, you know, and, and rents are actually the single biggest driver of the CPI it counts for 6% of the basket. So that's going to be this other tailwind that's going to keep pushing up inflation. Um, you know, we'll keep inflation higher for longer. So, but you know, the the long and the short is I think I think the RBA is probably going to just keep it at, at, at its current level for, you know, who, who knows how long, but at least another six months or so. And then uh, after that, they'll probably start cutting. But this can all change. You know, we could be we could be talking in two months' time and I could have changed my view, because that's what we do. And you know, as the data comes in, but but the but Michelle Bullock, the new RBA governor, she 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 um, this week she basically said, and that's what they said in the previous one that they're going to basically see what happens. That they're, they're happy with the way it's looking, um, and they've kind of set themselves a pretty high hurdle rate to hike again. They've just basically said that um, if you read between the lines, they said we're on hold unless we get a, a positive surprise in the data. So unless the data reverses and it shows that you know either inflation spikes, wages spike the labor market turns around or the or um spending suddenly picks up that they they that they're pretty happy with where rates are. Yeah. So that to me tells you that we're sort of peaked. And what this means for property prices is that we're going to continue having this massive immigration. Um the rental vacancy rate according to CoreLogic and PropTrack data just came out. 
says that we're basically the rental vacancy rates collapsed to its all time record low across the capital city. So we've got this tightening rental market just keeps tightening, rents keep rising. And once the RBA does start cutting interest rates, uh, say they do it mid next year, that's going to be a red rag to the bull for property prices because you're going to suddenly have these tailwinds that we're already seeing now, which is pushing up prices, collide with obviously lower you know, mortgage costs and serviceability and increased borrowing capacity. So I don't know about you, Catherine, but that to me smell, uh, you know, smells <laughs> a pretty big price increase. Yeah, I, it does. And I, I saw that um, KPMG had come out and said that over the next couple of years, prices in Australia are just going to rocket. Um, yep. I Makes sense. I like for the for the final two years of the cycle, which is kind of where we're heading into. That's exactly what well, it's what we've been forecasting at, at land. What I've been forecasting at land cycle investor and cycles trends and forecasts um, for Fat Tail for for a, you know a few years now. Um, so it's kind of what what we would expect. It's in line with the forecast. It's playing out as planned. And yeah, obviously, as you said, you know what that means for property investors. It, it's just bullish for property. And it, of course, you do not have to directly invest in property to take advantage of this. We're going to see the gains also represented in um, certain areas of the stock market, in REITs, um, which haven't had a good run um, for a while. But if we start to see, you know, that that there's gains in prices and particularly if, you know, the commercial sector starts to uh, pick up a little bit as well as um, people start to feel wealthier because their pri property prices are going to going to, going up, then we should see those areas of investment benefit also. Um, do you have any kind of take on on that? Because I know of you, you know, you run the macro business investment fund. Is that right? Yeah. Although, I, look, to be honest with you, I don't really run it. It's run by Damien and uh, Damien Class, and he, he 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 does you know most of all the sort of micro, um, you know, uh, yeah, decisions and that sort of thing. But yeah, I, I pretty much everything everything you said is right. Like, um, you know, it, it, it it's going to be uh, it's certainly bullish conditions for house prices. So. The fact that they're already going up when you've got this high interest rate environment just means that when they start cutting rates, it's going to just take off even more. And if and, and like you said, if you can't uh, invest directly, you do have these other exposures through real estate, real estate investment trusts, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. I just don't know. I'm not sure. It, uh, I'd have to look, but a lot of them are commercial property based. So I'm not it's sure if that's as good a bet. Yeah, we, we don't have any residential property. Yeah, that, that's the problem. So I'm not sure how you get the exposure yeah. on the residential side. Um, that's in, in America, they do not not over here. And, and, you know, it's one of the reasons why. I mean, in America, there's a lot of leading indicators for, the, you know, for this cycle as to when the cycle peaks. You know, we don't have, they're not so evident in Australia because of the size of our economy. But certainly when you're looking at REITs, you know, they need to look at the makeup of those REITs because there are, commercial is a big sector. It's, it's, a, it's a word that covers a vast amount of different types of real estate. And there's some commercial sectors, obviously, that perform better than others. I mean, with, with offices, for example, the vacancy rate in offices is still extremely high um, in the cities but there are some areas of the office sector which are under demand and it's really the very newer stock that's set up for that kind of hybrid model which has become more popular now where people don't spend every day in the office but they do still have a reason to go into the office um, yeah yeah well I mean look it's always a especially on the well on the, I'll talk about the residential side I'm not going to talk about the commercial because I don't know that as well and it seems a bit riskier given the state of the economy but you know, um, the government's basically engineered a housing hunger games, right? So it's basically, you know, uh, more and more people competing over less stock, effectively. And, you know, that's why we're seeing these record low vacancy rates. We're seeing, you know, these this panic. Um, people living in cars, group housing, blah, blah, blah. So obviously, you know, if you create a housing hunger games, that means if, you, if you're the owner of that, um, the plenty stock, well, you're obviously going to have a good time. So... Um, you know, I, I, I don't want to say like a spruker, but, um, you know, just looking at it logically, it seems like a, a pretty good bet um, to, you know, it, as long as you can pay your more, you know, you, you can pay these higher interest rates, et cetera. Um, but, you know, those are probably close to their peak peak level. So, you know, it could be in a situation if, you, you know, if you're paying your 7% mortgage now, that's probably too high, but like 6.5% mortgage now, there's a good chance that in two years' time it'll be five and a half percent. So it'll be, you know, it'll come down. Um, which is a lot better proposition than buying at two percent, you know, 20, 20 months ago, and then suddenly seeing it shoot up to six and a half. 
which is way worse. Um, and obviously, you know, if you're doing it from an investment point of view, you can negatively gear it. You've got rents going up at a good pace, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, you know, and you're going to, and, you, and you're almost certain not to suffer from uh, vacancy. Um, you'll be able to easily get a new person in there. Uh, you know, it's not going to sit, sit vacant for a you know, couple of months under these conditions. There's, you, you, there's going to be literally people fighting to get in your property. Um, so, you know, they're obviously good conditions if you're, if you're a wannabe investor. Um, not good for society, obviously, but, you know, it's, uh, yeah, you got to do what you got to do. So there we are. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, Lee. Uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to you and uh, and get your take on everything that's going on. You are the man that has his ear to the ground when it comes to the economy and really filtering through the news and exposing the truth of what is what is behind the uh, mainstream headlines. And because uh, anyone that's listening to this can find you at macrobusiness.com.au. Um, and everybody should go and subscribe to that site. It's an uh, absolute goldmine for really understanding the statistics, getting a lot of charts, getting updates that you cannot get anywhere else. And I say that very genuinely. And it's why you've become uh, so in demand um, on, you know, through the media, really on Sky News and the Bolt Report and <laughs> uh, just that, <laughs> that cover those non-mainstream bits of our economy. So, uh, yeah, thanks so much, Lee. We'll, I'll have you on again and uh, we'll continue the discussion. Yeah, no, can I just say, Catherine, um, I've actually got a, uh, it's not it's not the greatest YouTube channel, but I've got a YouTube channel at Leithvo, L-E-I-T-H-V-O, and that basically, all it is, it's nothing flash like Martin North or anything like that. All it is, it's basically where I just upload all my media interviews. So um, I just thought, I'm doing all this media for, you know, all left, right and centre, radio, TV, whatever. I need a central place where I can basically put it all. Um, so if you want to see some of the stuff I've done on Sky News, on Radio 2GB or whatever, um, I did 3AW a couple of weeks ago. I just, that's that's where you can go and actually watch so that, That's at, at least the O. Yeah, I'll at least the It's called, I think it's called Macro Breakdown, the um, the thing, but the um, the actual channel is at least the O, L-E-I-T-H-V-O. That's all it is. It's just, uh, it's my personal YouTube channel, which I just thought, hang on, I should be putting these in a central source. Otherwise, it's also, it's it's, it's as much for me. So, yeah. you know, when I'm older, I can go, you know, oh, five years time, I can easily find interviews I did other than yeah. losing them or being all over the internet somewhere. So, just, yeah, anyway. yeah, it's always a good thing because because these things are, are, are free and it's our time that's, that goes out when we do media interviews. So uh, we sit on them, we go on them, we don't get paid for it. And it's nice to have a record of, of kind of looking back and seeing what you said and, you know, the forecasts that were made. So I will uh, put a link to that for uh, readers that read this. And um, yeah, like I said, they, they abs everybody should sign up to the, to the macro business website. It's not an expensive subscription and it really, it really is invaluable information. Cheers, Catherine. Thanks very much. Thanks, Lee.